So now and good evening everyone. Welcome to our 19th Players Virtual Seminar. Players Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer, and going to be an influential healthcare leader in creating skilled communities for easily accessible knowledge and preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Yehel Adela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Health Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Abinet Ayaliu here back with us again to give a session to give a seminar on the topic investigation of surgical and anesthetic diseases. So you might remember Dr. Abinata Yalio from her previous sessions on Blue Hills Ethiopia, medical error and leg negligence, the days process and confirmation of days as well as certifications of these seminars. You can find her previous uh, webinars on our YouTube channel as well as the Blue Health CPD website. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Abinat, Dr. Abinat Ayaru is an assistant professor of forensic medicine and uh, toxicology. So Dr. Abinat, the stage is all yours, you can begin. So good evening everybody. Uh, for those of you whom we've met before on similar sessions, it's nice to have you here again. And for those of you really joining the seminar, welcome. Uh, so today's session, as has been well introduced, uh, would be about investigation of surgical and anesthetic cases. I would like to thank uh, Blue Health Ethiopia for giving me the chance uh, to discuss topics that I found are uh, of relevance and a lot of significance to fellow colleagues since the uh, forensic investigation, in general the forensic medicine science uh, specialty is not uh, well known in our country and its uh, role uh, is also uh, not well uh, introduced. I also see fellow colleagues uh, of physicians from different departments uh, going undergoing a lot of litigations and uh, um, a lot of uh, procedures under the legal system, uh, most of which are because of lack of knowledge on both sides. So uh, this is one of uh, topics of my interest, which can be uh, shine a better light on. So uh, what's the background for such uh, discussion? Uh, informative and sociological awareness of the public about their perceived rights please underline perceived here, uh, and prerogatives is uh, evident from the spread of malpractice. As you see, all uh, surgical and anesthetic data and related data uh, are perceived as whenever the outcome is uh, unintended, as perceived by the uh, society, there is a tendency to blame the medical uh, uh, team for malpractice. And that's not always true, but it's at the same time not always true that the medical team is not uh, uh, at fault. So what's, uh, how do we uh, settle the, what's the middle ground here? So uh, for such data, uh, autopsy investigations uh, are mandatory. So how do we investigate what's causing the data in such uh, cases uh, and who's uh, at fault, who's to... Uh, take the responsibility, uh, we'll see in details in such cases. So the role of the forensic pathologist in surgical and anesthetic deaths, I'm putting this so that uh, I'm assuming most of you are not from the forensic department, so uh, this is to put an introduction uh, onto what the forensic pathologist is doing in such uh, cases. Uh, so, hence the forensic pathologist involved in this as a difficult and often professionally sensitive task. On one side, there is the uh, legal and uh, justice system to serve. On the other side, there is the professional who is a fellow colleague. So, it's a relatively uh, sensitive and difficult position to be at uh, for the forensic pathologist. Also, uh, whenever uh, possible, uh, it's, it's recommended that such uh, data are investigated 
by a forensic pathologist in an independent institution. So why uh, the first one is, uh, as it is, the public and the private interest, there is a tendency that uh, to think and to believe that the medical team is totally at fault in such data. Uh, so, uh, and if the forensic pathologist is from the same institution where the date has occurred or part of the care has taken place, uh, it's easy for the public to believe that there has been a siding to the professional. Uh, also, if the uh, in investigation is done in the same institution and assume that, the, let's assume that the surgeon or the anesthetist or the medical team in that uh, uh, situation is found to be at fault, there is going to be a professional embarrassment. So this is why the uh, investigation is advised to be done and by a pathologist in an independent institution. Also, it's sometimes uh, very useful to have a technical advice and expert opinion of an independent clinical consultant. Similarly, the, in, the clinical consultant should be independent of the institution. However, the surgeon and the anesthetist in the concerned case should attend the autopsy. We'll see the, why this, is, uh, this has to be in the future slides. So uh, the general recommendations and preparation for the investigation of such cases, uh, attendance, attendance of the clinicians at the autopsy is very uh, critical. Uh, because in cases associated with anesthesia, uh, this is uh, more useful than the post-mortem dissection in concluding findings and in understanding findings also. Why? Because cases uh, uh, related to the anesthetic process are usually uh, the effect of physiological and pharmacological uh, phenomena and the post-mortem dissection is usually revealing of very uh, minor amount of uh, structural evidence. So uh, in case where the uh, surgeon and the anesthetist is not available, uh, every effort should be made to secure the presence of someone who knows the circumstance of the case. And it's not advised that a junior doctor, especially one who doesn't know uh, about the case and the patient and the circumstances of death, is not al uh, is allowed to uh, attend the autopsy. Uh, in the event where the forensic pathologist and the institution does not call on surgeons and anesthesiologists in uh, uh, question, it's advised that surgeons and anesthesiologists ask for a seat in the autopsy whenever their cases are being uh, investigated. Mm, so, especially as I mentioned earlier, in anesthetic related dates, more to the surgical dates, uh, the conversation with the anesthetist may provide all the data to which the, the cause of death based support. Maybe the forensic pathologist could not see anything or could not understand anything. Because as I said, uh, changes are physiological and pharmacological, which are difficult to demonstrate, usually difficult to demonstrate on autopsy. Uh, so in general, discussion between pathologist, surgeon, and anesthetist is uh, priceless as it may help to arrive to an amicable conclusion. So the discussion between the pathologist, the forensic pathologist, the surgeon, and the anesthetist is not only to help the fellow colleagues uh, or in the departments of surgery and anesthesia. It's not to give them a getaway or to make them escape the litigation system. It's also uh, very helpful uh, in uh, forming the opinion so that uh, whoever is being uh, assumed to be a victim of the process can also get the fair justice that was uh, deserved. Uh, so before the autopsy, uh, there are uh, certain conditions that should be fulfilled so that the autopsy uh, becomes a meaningful uh, process. Uh, standing orders should be issued to hospital in the jurisdiction of the uh, forensic uh, institution so that no post-mortem interference with the body is made. 
So these are usually unintended ones. There is a tendency to panic uh, and to disrupt most things. And there's also uh, the mistake that is unknowingly, unintendedly um, done by the portering staff or the technical and nursing staff. So uh, there should be a standing order so that no uh, interference with the body is made uh, post the death. If the body is to be uh, subjected to for forensic investigation. Uh, so uh, the other thing is such vigilance spares the unintended discard of sometimes the only one and a very vital piece of evidence. Maybe uh, the interference with the body by the technical or portering or nursing staff uh, could be discarding the only evidence that could help in the conclusion of the cause of death. So uh, all due care should be made and standing orders should be passed so that no interference with the body is made. Uh, obviously, there are going to be many numerous surgical and anesthetic devices uh, attached to the body, like uh, airways, endotracheal tubes, indwelling needles, intravascular cannula, catheters, drains, chest tubes, and electrodes, and uh, different processes. So uh, if the body is to be investigated, and none of this should be removed before the autopsy, and they should be uh, passed along with the body in their site, uh, uh, so that the forensic surgeon could check for the patency and proper placing of the such uh, devices. This could be the reason why the death has happened. Maybe endotracheal tube has dislodged, maybe it was intubated into the esophagus, maybe it has caused uh, laryngeal spasm or whatever. So maybe this is the only evidence uh, and such uh, devices, surgical and anesthetic devices should be handed over in their placement in the body to the forensic uh, pathologist. Uh, during the autopsy, uh, care must be taken before dissection, surgical emphysema, pneumothorax, or embolism. Uh, if the history dictates that such uh, conditions could arise and could have uh, affected the day, uh, history should be, uh, and description of the surgical procedure and anesthetic procedure should be collected and a demonstration of uh, such complications as emphysema, pneumothorax, or, or air embolism should be attempted on uh, autopsy. So for those of you from the surgical and anesthetic department, it's uh, worth to note that such uh, complications are demonstrable on autopsy. So don't assume that nothing is uh, demonstrable on autopsy. So these uh, complications are easily demonstrable. And uh, be careful in, when you involve in uh, procedures that could result in such complications. Uh, there are various esophageal intubations, as I said before. It's a common one. And uh, in the events where the uh, esophagus has been intubated and the procedure has been rectified, there's, there still could be a ring in the esophagus uh, at the level of the tracheal tube. Uh, and if uh, anesthetic has been leaked, nitrous oxide uh, in the stomach and intestine could also be sampled and demonstrated. So these are the processes uh, that should be demonstrated before the dissection. This should be suspected from the uh, description of the procedure and they should be demonstrated before uh, the dissection is instituted. So, uh, for the forensic pathologist, there are techniques to, to demonstrate these things, and I think it's too technical and detailed to describe here. So, the home tech message is for you guys that these uh, processes could be demonstrated, and it's also the objectives of one of the objectives of the autopsy. So, more often than not, uh, postmortem radiography is involved in the investigation of surgical and anesthetic diseases as any foreign device. Uh, they could be detected by post-mortem radiography. And the recommendation is the forensic facility that carries out the investigation uh, should be equipped with the post-mortem radiography uh, facility. Uh, uh, the other thing is uh, more than the other cases, for the other cases, the fullest information is needed uh, in such data's uh, investigation of such data's and patient medical notes, nursing records, 
which could at times be more useful than the doctor's records, as they are more detailed and more frequent, and any other relevant information should be recorded before the autopsy is started. If the hospital laboratory has received blood specimens, which it usually does, and if the body, if death has occurred and the body is to be investigated, so those specimens should be retained and be available for further uh, analysis and comparison. Uh, so, considerations of the autopsy in surgical and anesthetic cases, as I've said before, structural data, uh, structural evidences, especially in anesthetic data, may be minimal or even absent. And uh, in surgical uh, and postoperative data, uh, there are other factors that make the autopsy a bit too difficult technically. The first one is due to the surgical and inter intervention and sequelae, the uh, tissues may appear differently and it may be difficult to interpret. Uh, also, exudates, sepsis, adhesions, and hemorrhage and edema that have uh, occurred following the surgical intervention may have distorted the anatomy uh, and it may make the dissection difficult. Also, postmortem changes can further complicate the appearances. So, example, uh, suture lines in the intestine or stomach may appear to be leaking, and this may be caused by autolysis, or when the autopsy uh, surgeon handles the tissue, it may cause further disruption of such uh, tissues. So the interpretation, this is why one, one of the reasons why the surgeon should attend the autopsy uh, and dictate uh, what happened uh, the procedure and the circumstances of death uh, for the autopsy surgeon. Uh, more importantly, the forensic pathologist uh, is uh, an expert in uh, tissues uh, after death. That's what uh, we are used to seeing. So we're far from the complex techniques of modern surgery and anesthesia. And so without the help of the anesthetist and the surgeon, it's very difficult. The knowledge of the forensic pathologist is insufficient to appreciate, analyze, and criticize the changes following complex techniques of surgery and anesthesia. So why this is why uh, such cases should be attended by the clinician, critically by the surgeon and the, the anesthetist. So, uh, thus far, we've said autopsy reveals few uh, findings. So, but autopsy is still being done. So, what's the role and significance? The first uh, very important significance is to exclude other causes of death. If the surgery or the anesthesia is not the cause of death, uh, autopsy is your getaway to prove that. Uh, also, uh, not all uh, cases are not demonstrable. Some are demonstrable, so autopsy picks uh, those detectable complications of procedure, equipment failure, or technical mishaps. It's also vital to settle uh, diseases due to uh, medical negligence in perioperative diseases like retention of swabs, scissors, and other foreign bodies. So we have discussed this in medical negligence. In such cases, uh, it's said that the case speaks for itself. The case is self-explanatory. And this is not uh, a date related to the surgical proce process and uh, anesthesia. It's by itself uh, medical negligence. So the modern cause of death uh, after surgery and anesthesia. Uh, as we, I have said earlier, it's easier for the society to believe that all data related to operation and anesthesia procedure are the fault of the medical team who did the, who attended, did and attended the procedure. Uh, however, and hence, operative data and anesthetic data are uh, misleading terms. That those are usually used by the uh, society, but they are misleading the, uh, terms. So the right uh, term could be perioperative data, that is data surrounding surgery and anesthesia, data surrounding the operative procedure in general. So that would be it. When it includes the procedures in pathology and radiology, all procedures in diagnostic, therapeutic, and anesthetic procedures, it becomes periprocedural complications. 
So for our uh, discussion, we use the perioperative term, particular to surgery and anesthesia. Uh, so what's causing the date in this case anyway? Let's see. So a review by Simpson, uh, uh, review of 500 data. And as you can see, 56%, which is more than half, were occasioned by the disease for which the operation was conducted. 30%, another significant proportion, uh, were the outcome of shock and inevitable risks of the operation itself. 8% by the risks and complication of anesthesia, and 6% could be pinned upon overdosage, maladministration, or by trace of anesthetic. So uh, if you see the tabulated numbers here, it's pretty much uh, a lesser proportion, quite a lesser proportion of the data that were uh, attributed to the surgical and uh, anesthetic uh, process as reviewed by Simpson in 500 days. In general, uh, there are four categories of mode and cause of death uh, surrounding surgery and anesthesia. The first one is uh, directly caused by the disease or injury for which the operation or the anesthetic was being carried out. Uh, logically thinking, the person uh, already had a significant condition that would have uh, probably led to the death if the surgery, so that was why the surgery and the anesthesia was uh, mandated in the first place. This is not true for all cases, but in most cases, people do not go under anesthesia and surgery for entertainment purposes. They must have they usually have serious conditions. So that same condition is the result of the cause of death in such cases. The second group is disease or abnormality other than that for which the procedure was being carried out. An unrelated procedure, uh, an unrelated disease or injury or abnormality that might have exerted its uh, fatal effects uh, during the surgical and anesthetic procedure. Uh, the third one is a mishap during or a complication of the surgical or diagnostic procedure. This is relatively a minor one. And the rarest cause is mishap uh, during or complication of the anesthesia being administered. So unlike popular opinion, the surgical and the anesthetic procedures contribute to a very minor, relatively minor group of the data. Uh, so, to see these uh, cases, uh, modes and uh, mechanisms of death causing the diseases in such uh, perioperative uh, cases, uh, in a further detail, uh, the, the diseases directly caused by disease or injury for which surgery is performed, these are the largest contributing group. Uh, so, many diseases during a surgical or diagnostic procedure are caused by this. And here the question becomes, uh, if the death was already imminent, why was the surgery and the anesthesia carried out? So this becomes the challenge in uh, investigation of such cases. So ideally, even in the deadliest of cases, there must be some chance of cure or even palliation. It could be for palliative uh, effects or there is some chance of cure. Otherwise, the surgeon will have to answer why he did the operation in the case where the disease was imminent. But in reality, in the actual practice, even though mostly the case is known to be uh, eminently fatal, the decision to operate, uh, not to operate, may be difficult. But if the case goes for uh, uh, investigation and there is a medical legal question to answer, uh, the surgeon would be, and the anesthetist would, would be at a very uh, difficult pos position. You cannot make the decision not to operate was difficult as a valid reason to operating on a case where the day was imminent. So in such cases where the original condition was the cause of date, uh, most medical uh, medical legal systems mention the original cause, uh, the original condition as the cause of death. Since the uh, interference, the surgical and anesthetic interference had a negligible uh, contribution in the death. So this is to mean as the death would have anyways occurred without the surgical and anesthetic intervention. 
So the American Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, it's not all cases that would go into debt if the surgery were not uh, was not done anyway. Not all surgical uh, conditions and injuries would cause uh, death. Uh, so which deaths are acceptable if uh, the original cause of the original disease or injury uh, caused the death and which cases are not acceptable, which cases are supposed to survive. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists has made the following uh, uh, categorization. So it's five and it's those in uh, group five, SA group five, uh, serious disease uh, that their death can be expected within 24 hours with or without treatment. So uh, according to the recommendation of SA, classes one, two, three, uh, if death occurred in such classes, uh, there is a uh, recommendation that the date should be investigated because such uh, patients were assumed to survive. Their risk was uh, quite low. Uh, and in those uh, classes, class four, those in class four, uh, if there were elective and not emergency procedures, uh, they are also included in the case where the date was not expected and acceptable and they should be fully investigated. However, in general, all data surrounding surgery and anesthesia are recommended to be reported, and mostly they end up being uh, investigated. So the challenge for the forensic pathologist in such cases, uh, let's see this uh, example. If a patient has a leaking erotic aneurysm, and if the patient dies shortly after the surgery or even while the surgeon was making uh, the initial uh, skin incision. So we would mostly agree, most of us would agree that the initial condition, the aortic aneurysm, which was leaking, uh, contributes, contributed majorly to the death. But however, uh, are we sure that the whole process of preparation for surgery and anesthesia and the skin incision by themselves have not contributed to hastening the death. So this is the dilemma for the forensic pathologist to decide. Uh, you cannot omit the, it's difficult to omit the contribution of the surgery and anesthesia and the skin incision in creating fearful uh, conditions uh, and further devitalizing the tissues uh, so that uh, it's difficult to conclude that with or without the surgery, the aortic aneurysm would have caused the death at the time it caused. Maybe the person would have a few days or a few years or a few minutes to survive had the surgery not been uh, ensued. Uh, the other dilemma is when a person dies of a pulmonary embolus, this is an example, after an elective uh, gastrectomy, uh, it's relatively clear to draw the connection between the operation and the death. But the challenge for the forensic pathologist is there has been one fifth of cases of pulmonary embolism uh, where there was no predisposing factors. So what does this mean? Pulmonary embolism could occur in cases where there was no known predisposing factors. So just because there was a surgery in this case, is it fair to uh, conclude that the surgery was the uh, sole contributor or the sole risk factor for the pulmonary embolus. Pulmonary embolisms, according to the studies, have occurred uh, even without any predisposing factors. So this is the dilemma for the forensic pathologist. It's not, uh, all cases are not straightforward. The other thing is uh, trauma and uh, uh, surgical intervention. Uh, this is a case where mostly it's a draw you cannot separate the relative contributions of each to a death. So uh, by this, it means that uh, you cannot attribute the surgeon and the surgery and the anesthetist for such cases, despite the popular belief, because both the trauma and the surgical operation have uh, significantly contributed to the condition. So these uh, uh, challenges are best uh, approached by the but if test, that means would the death have occurred when it did if the oppression, uh, including the surgery and the anesthesia, had not taken place? 
so this is the better approach thus far, but it's still uh, at times very impossible to answer all uh, challenges through this uh, test even. And so the other group is death due to a disease or disability different from the one the surgery was performed for. Uh, so if this is a condition, uh, where this is the condition, there has to be a distinction between the cases that were known before the operation and the cases that were that went unsuspected. So, so for the cases that were known before the operation, uh, the calculation should be on the risk. The risk benefit ratio is the justification for to operate uh, and make the patient undergo surgery. In high risk to benefit ratio, issue of medical legal uh, negligence, medical negligence could still be issued if operation was carried out and caused death. So this means if the risk of surgery and anesthesia was higher than the case to be operated and be cured, uh, there's still, even though the condition was known before the operation, so it still needs to be justified that the risk of operating was relatively lower and the benefit of being operated was relatively higher. Uh, and uh, when the condition was an unsuspected one, it goes into the, the challenge then becomes if the surgeon and anesthetist should have uh, diagnose the condition or if missing that condition is acceptable one. So uh, let's see an example in calculating the risk to operate in a condition known for the operation. There's, let's assume there is a patient who had a non-obstructing hernia and who is also known to have chronic obstructive airways disease. So uh, not word here is that the, the hernia was a non-obstructing one and the chronic obstructive airway disease was already known. So if uh, an attempt is made to do an elective and prophylactic operation so that obstruction of the hernia, strangulation of the hernia does not occur, the patient's uh, risk of chronic obstructive airway disease causing the death is higher. So operating, doing an elective and prophylactic operation on such patient is uh, hardly justifiable. But let's see uh, where a situation where this changes dramatically. Let's say hernia becomes strangulated. So in this case, uh, operating on the hernia becomes a life-saving procedure. So uh, it becomes a justified one and the risk benefit ratio dramatically changes. So the surgeon is, and anesthetist is uh, justified to make the patient undergo because it becomes now a life-saving one. So here the question becomes, the operative and anesthetic techniques should be modified according to the already known uh, disease other than the one being operated on. Uh, so when the cause of death was an unsuspected disease, uh, the surgeon and the anesthetist is justified uh, to miss such cases, even though they are fatal, uh, the diagnosis could be missed if, you, if they did not have diagnostic means. For example, uh, pheochromocytoma, it could be a fatal condition, but uh, if you do not have the diagnostic means, uh, you're not supposed to speculate. You're not uh, like responsible for missing a diagnosis of your chromocytoma. If a patient was not symptomatic and if you did not have a diagnostic means, so you're relatively excused for missing a pheochromocytoma. But uh, if you miss a case of hypertension, or a lung disease or ischemic heart disease, especially in the occasion where the uh, patient has been uh, symptomatic before the operation for such cases, it still becomes, uh, you're not going to get away that the condition that caused the death was unrelated to the one the surgery and anesthesia was performed for. It was still a significant one and it was not acceptable to miss such uh, simple yet critical conditions. So in this case, missing hypertension or ischemic heart disease could become a case of medical negligence. So uh, the third category, relatively a minor one, is data uh, as a result of failure of surgical technique. This is quite rare, especially in the modern and advanced uh, 
uh, error. Uh, this is a rare contributor to the peri operative status. Uh, however, when it happens, it could be a true accident. Uh, and a true accident could be from unusually difficult operative circumstances, uh, unexpected anatomical variations, or even failure of equipment. The other one is the surgeon could be uh, could make a medical error, and it could even be an incompetent one. Uh, it's not always that uh, incompetence from the surgeon and anesthetist do not cause death. It could be rare, it's usually rare, but still incompetence and error uh, from the surgical side from the, uh, and anesthetic side uh, causes uh, dates. Also, the other one is a failure of equipment. In this case, uh, the pathologist can barely comment on such cases, but uh, the whole description, since the pathologist is usually the one who settles the cause of death, who settles the medical uh, certification of the cause of death in such cases, uh, whatever happened and uh, the significance of each equipment and where was uh, the uh, error, where happened the error, should be explained to the pathologist. Uh, so uh, the forensic pathologist will obviously should be very careful in producing detailed and objective and impartial report. Impartial is very critical. Uh, so. And whenever the surgeon and the anesthetist has attended, it's critical that there is an agreement uh, reached between what actually was found at autopsy. Uh, the surgeon should have a clear description, should have a clear agreement and uh, understanding. So this doesn't mean uh, if the surgeon has made a mistake and that it was due to his uh, mistake or their mistake, uh, this doesn't mean the pathologist should uh, give him a pass. If there was a mistake, he should be informed that there was a mistake and it was found on autopsy clearly. So whatever was found on autopsy uh, should be communicated in, during the attendance of the surgeon and dancers. So that's due to anesthetic administration. This is the rarest group in perioperative diseases, but whenever they occur, uh, they are uh, they could be uh, the source of uh, medical legal issues and generally why it requires uh, discussion. Uh, additionally, there is the tendency on the part of the relatives and even legal uh, bodies like lawyers and the police and the court uh, usually believe that the cause of death is the anesthetic because the death happened uh, in a close uh, time up to the occurrence, to the administration of anesthesia. Uh, so, but let's see how much anesthesia is uh, contributing to the uh, perioperative dates. But survey for the ASA, American Society of Anesthesiologists, in the 1980s uh, showed these uh, two numbers. Uh, one in every 166 patients died within six days of surgical operation, but the anesthesia being the reason, sole, uh, the sole reason was one in 10,000 deaths. And the event where the anesthesia contributed was one in every 1,700 patients. So you could see the cause of anesthesia as a, the cause of the cause of deaths to be due to the anesthesia is very rare, but it still needs investigation. So uh, most anesthetic related diseases, again, despite popular opinion, they are not caused by the anesthetic agent, but other aspects of the procedure. And the major cause of true anesthetic fatalities usually uh, are inexperienced and insufficiently supervised junior staff. This is also the other significance why anesthetic related deaths uh, should be discussed and investigated. Uh, relatively, those uh, diseases related to the anesthetic diseases are preventable because they are highly related to human error. So, uh, communications in anesthesiology publication uh, categorized and approached the diseases due to associated with anesthesia. The first one is respiratory and circulatory problems. The second one is problems related to local or regional anesthesia. And the third one is 
utilization of the apparatus. It is in the third one where the basically in all the three groups, uh, human error contributes to significant uh, proportion. But in utilization of the apparatus, uh, unskilled, unskillful, and uh, uh, poorly trained uh, human uh, resource in the anesthetic department uh, pretty much contributes to uh, the largest proportion. So respiratory embarrassment, hypoxia, is the demon here. Uh, the ultimate matter of great concern in anesthesia-related data. So intraoperative problems are naturally going to affect the oxygenation even in otherwise normal ones. So there is going to be some imbalance and uh, some um, embarrassment to the respiratory system in the normal course of operations. However, uh, when the hypoxia is significant and uncompensated uh, for, it could cause uh, death. So hypoxia could occur due to hypoventilation, hypoventilation by precipitated iatrogenically over because of over sedation, prolonged anesthesia, chest fixation, misplaced tracheal intubation, too generous use of oxygen, the condition that's usually overlooked. Uh, most, mostly oxygen is not assumed to be uh, on the uh, damaging extent, but uh, too generous use of oxygen is one cause of hypoventilation and chronic respiratory insufficiency and adequate reversal of muscle relaxation. So here, uh, the uh, pre anesthetic uh, evaluation is also a critical one in uh, assessing the patients that are at risk of hypoventilation. So if we could assess that, we could modify the uh, anesthetic technique and we could also um, modify the medication that's administered. Uh, the other one is uh, improper or excessive premedication like morphine, tranquilizers, and barbiturates causing central depression. Uh, and packs and detractors, these are uh, usually tend to be overlooked, but packs and detractors may cause, uh, may press upon the diaphragm mechanically and impair movement of the lungs. The other one is regurgitation of secrets, secretions, uh, gastric content, food, uh, blood, dangers which could easily happen in a uh, sedated patient undergoing anesthesia. And this could cause obstruction of airway, chem chemical contamination of tracheobronchial tree and chemical pneumonitis, and uh, creeping into the lung uh, tissue, causing long-term lung abscesses. Uh, tracheal intubation, uh, it's uh, instituted to prevent such uh, regurgitation and leaks but still, uh, prevention may not be absolute. Uh, at the autopsy, uh, this is one of the things the autopsy tends to demonstrate, the leaking of gastric contents and uh, the oral cavity contents and other uh, mechanical objects like the uh, dentures and uh, tongue suppressors. But still, uh, finding of gastric contents in the airways is not always the result of anti-mortem uh, regurgitation. The normal process of death by itself causes regurgitation of gastric contents. In 25%, the agonal, uh, the agonal circumstance in the death causes the gastric content to leak into the uh, airway. So uh, it should be very carefully scrutinized and anti-mortem uh, source of the process of regurgitation should be proven that it occurred before while the patient was alive. So there are ways to demonstrate this, but it still is not an easy opinion to form. So care should be taken for a forensic pathologists not to interpret the finding of gastric contents in the airways as the cause of death and uh, anti-mortem process without uh, having gone the process to prove that the process happened while the patient was alive. So airway obstruction is another real danger. Danger This could happen from blood, teeth, dentures, and faults in connecting tubing, 
swaps and abnormal posture of the neck. So in the physical uh, uh, physical foreign bodies that could be proven uh, are relatively easy uh, cause of death to demonstrate, but uh, events of laryngeal spasm and abnormal posturing of the neck uh, are difficult ones. The other one is massive transfusion leading to pulmonary edema due to and leading to volume overload. But the inhalation of toxic agents, the inhalation of the anesthetic agent to be toxic and causing pulmonary edema is uh, relatively a less likely cause. As we saw in the previous slides, deaths due to the anesthetic agent per se are quite rare. Uh, rupture of an enthysematous bullet uh, and blip during operative procedures. This is relatively a demonstrable procedure on autopsy. You could see the blip uh, easily. So, uh, depending on the history, uh, such uh, findings could be easily demonstrated. Uh, the other complications include uh, emphysema and uh, emph pneumothorax. Uh, Neumothorax is also another demonstrable uh, phenomenon on autopsy. So uh, cardiac embarrassment, usually the cardiac, this is the second most common uh, complication from the anesthetic procedure. So normally the heart functions, even the normal function uh, of the heart depends on the balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems of the um, divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So whenever there is uh, an unbalanced stimulation of either of the systems, it could cause uh, cardiac embarrassment. So the process of anesthesia and surgery could easily stimulate either of the two systems. So the causes uh, why the process of surgery and anesthesia could stimulate either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic systems are tabulated below. So uh, hypoxia, even though it's a respiratory embarrassment, it also causes two cardiac embarrassment. Uh, hypoxia, acidosis, and hypotension uh, tend to sensitize the myocardium to the action of catecholamines, and this further stimulates uh, the myocardium irritable. It makes the myocardium irritable and causes death by causing ventricular fibrillations. Also, uh, drugs and uh, diseases also sensitize the myocardium. Uh, oxygen starvation of the brain and the heart. This is a, this creates a cascade of chain. Already, the brain and the heart are under a lot of uh, sedative and other drugs. So, when you add oxygen starvation to that, uh, and the brain is uh, quite sensitive to oxygen starvation. Brain cells when uh, deprived of oxygen, they tend to survive 46 uh, minutes and accumulation of carbon dioxide, uh, even for a shorter period, de decreases the survival of the brain cells for a shorter period. So already uh, sensitized brain and heart undergoing oxygen starvation uh, are easily to are easy to succumb into uh, cardiac embarrassment and uh, deaths usually. So hypovolemia, this is a very uh, critical condition and yet a preventable one. It's also one factor that contributes to cardiac embarrassment. Unrecognized shock and inadequately managed shock is common cause of anesthesia-related uh, deaths. So uh, shock could occur uh, due to the following conditions in anesthesia-related diseases. Uh, failure to recognize and adequately manage perioperative hypovolemia. There is a tendency to overlook uh, borderline or hypovolemic uh, blood pressures, blood pressure records. Uh, there's also improper dosage of anesthetic agents or spinal or epidural anesthesia. So that creates compensated hypovolemia into uncompensated state. And the, uh, after the operation is uh, done and the anesthetic is administered, there is a tendency to inadequately replace uh, intraoperative losses. So this uh, further contributes to cardiac embarrassment and death. Conversely, uh, over-enthusiastic uh, fluid replacement could cause 
pulmonary edema and con contribute to death. Also, uh, rapid infusion of uh, large quantities of blood may cause to dilutional uh, deficiencies of uh, clotting factor, factor 5, which is also called the labile factor, and uh, uh, bleeding uh, and uh, hypovolemia could issue and death could follow. Uh, so, local, regional, and spinal anesthesia, this is the other group uh, of anesthesia. Uh, so, this also have uh, effects in causing death. So, local anesthetics, they are, uh, they exert their action by preventing local impulses arising from and passing through the nervous tissue where the local anesthesia is uh, administered. Also, uh, these uh, agents are usually administered along vasoconstrictor drug. Uh, so large uh, doses of vasoconstrictors could depress the central nervous system and they could also depress the myocardium leading to hypotension, unconsciousness and circulatory collapse. So don't think because the anesthesia has been local and regional and even spinal, uh, there are no systemic effects. So uh, other important complications from local anesthetics is bacterial con contamination of the site. Uh, on the area of the block, and it could cause in infection or cellulitis. Where there is chemical contamination, there is the tendency of uh, necrosis or sterile abscess, needle trauma going below uh, the uh, blood vessel, into the blood vessel, and uh, penetrating on uh, unintended sites uh, could cause hematoma and gangrene formations. Air embolism, uh, where the local anesthetics is administered into adjacent to cervical veins, pneumothorax, from uh, brachial plexus or stellate ganglion block, and broken needle or catheter, if not removed uh, at the right amount of uh, time, they could cause, they could act as a needles and be a source of infection and cellulitis and abscess. Uh, regional anesthesia complications that are worth mentioning. IVRA, intravenous regional anesthesia, uh, is a technique applied for various types of hand and forearm surgery, but IVRA has been reported to be associated with serious complications and death. Uh, Atikan Head has emphasized uh, there is a cardiac arrest from IVRA, especially uh, particularly with pivacaine, where uh, the tourniquet is applied inadequately or where it was released prematurely and where the anesthetic that was uh, the original anesthetic that had access to the uh, vascular system or if the drug is injected rapidly into a large vein. Uh, so liposuction is a surgery we are all familiar with and it's uh, one of the most frequently uh, performed uh, cosmetic operation. So liposuction uses extensive uh, regional anesthesia uh, and it also uh, uses uh, lidocaine and epinephrine uh, to be diluted in physiologic saline to act as vasoconstrictors. Uh, from uh, liposuction, the most frequent complications were local, uh, extending to systemic effects, bacterial infections uh, such as necrotizing fasciitis as gangrene and different forms of sepsis uh, causing death eventually. But there is an interesting uh, case where liposuction has caused death, and this is uh, from a 38 year old female. This is a real time uh, case, and uh, the patient underwent liposuction of the abdomen uh, and both hips and thighs. And after 30 minutes of anesthesia administration, the patient had a seizure of tonic clonic type and became asystolic and died. Uh, at autopsy, uh, no structural uh, finding could be done, uh, could be found, and that the initial uh, conclusion was to be made as anaphylactic shock. But uh, since it did not fit for uh, anaphylactic shock, further investigation was done. Toxicological analysis from the uh, heart blood showed lidocaine and mepivacaine in the concentrations uh, displayed here, respectively. 
So based on the autopsy findings, the history and the toxicology results, the cause of death was an overdose of local anesthetic agents. So the court of law uh, ruled the death as an involuntary homicide due to gross negligence. The anesthetic agents were administered in uh, negligently in uh, excessive doses. So systemic reactions and toxicity could also be encountered. Anaphylactic uh, reactions and dermatitis. Uh, though allergy is often cited as the cause, it's rarely uh, the case in uh, an, due to the anesthesia uh, and the anesthetic agent. Uh, anaphylactic reactions are uh, the more likely uh, cases, but generally systemic reactions and toxicities are rare. So in spinal anesthesia, it's relatively the safe type, but still uh, faulty techniques could result in uh, complications and dates. One is uh, hypotension due to paralysis of symptomatic outflow. Uh, it's the most common complication uh, causing due to faulty technique. In high spinal anesthesia, the anesthetic could uh, gain access to involve sympathetic fibers to the heart and may lead to cardiac inhibition. So this becomes unopposed by the parasympathetic fibers, so it usually succumbs to death. Damage to spinal roots, uh, chronic adhesive arachidonitis, injury to spinal ligaments, and osteomyelitis of the vertebra may occur. Uh, the autopsy is usually difficult. It's in epidural and spinal anesthesia. It's recommended that uh, the spinal cord is dissected and the um, injection sites in the dura is demonstrated. This is uh, quite easier said than done. So, uh, also the osteomyelitis of the vertebra and uh, damage to spinal roots causing paralysis and muscle weakness and later respiratory embarrassment uh, may be far from the anesthetic episode, but still, if the relationship could be demonstrated that the anesthesia is the sole and underlying source of the condition, it still could be uh, inferred as the cause of death. So just because the time gap is far, it doesn't mean the anesthesia uh, does not become the cause of death. So uh, this is the instruments and instrumentations uh, section. So this is relatively even more uh, rare cause of uh, death in uh, anesthesia related days, even more rare to uh, respiratory and cardiac embarrassment uh, cases. However, because the human error accounts for significant proportion, it's uh, an issue of medical legal significance. Human error, according to uh, Cooper and Newborn, uh, was responsible for 82% of the, the dates in this case, related to instruments and instrumentation. So uh, other factors included inadequate communication among staff, has and destruction. Uh, so the human errors, according to Cooper, were uh, classified for, into three categories. And uh, they were technical, judgmental, and monitoring and uh, vigilance failure. Uh, all these are related to poor uh, training and uh, lack of uh, accurate uh, judgmental uh, skills. So these are relatively preventable uh, conditions. So incidents because of the three groups of human errors include the occurrence of this. So we will go through these conditions. Uh, you know. So uh, as is done for the surgeon, the anesthetist is also to be evaluated for the cases uh, that contributed uh, to the death that were different from the condition that the uh, patient underwent anesthesia. So if the condition was known, the modifying anesthetic technique and uh, calculating the ratio, risk to benefit ratio is expected. If the condition was unforeseeable, then it is again uh, evaluated against if it was possible to diagnose such a condition or if unforeseeability was an acceptable one. So such conditions include hemoglobinopathies, coronary thrombosis, transfusion infections, 
hyperthermia, muscle weakness, and anesthetic gas ignition. So ignition of anesthetic gases and fire in the operating room. This is not an uncommon incident. So the antiseptic, spirit-based antiseptic, and even any electrical apparatus is potentially dangerous. In the past, there was a tendency to put uh, fire in the anesthetic room totally to uh, accidental causes. But currently, it's uh, uh, the lineage is towards uh, to delineate such cases into preventable ones. And malignant hyperthermia, uh, so you know this condition to be uh, pharmacogenetic disorder of the skeletal muscle, and it's manifested by sudden rising temperature, so sometimes reaching 43 degrees, stiffening of med skeletal muscles, rapid heart rate and respiratory distress. Currently, mortality due to malignant hyperthermia has significantly decreased. Uh, however, the condition, the significance is the condition should be suspected in a family history of death after anesthesia. And if such history was obtained before the operation and anesthesia, the condition should be suspected. And if the condition was diagnosed uh, for the first time in the uh, current uh, anesthesia and operation, uh, the family members should be advised for screening. This is the medical legal significance of malignant hyperthermia. Uh, so, what is the significance of the autopsy? How does it look like in anesthesia-related diseases? Similar recommendations for the anesthetist in more uh, gravity and significance is also extended for the uh, for the ones that were told for the surgery for the surgeon are also extended for the anesthetist. Uh, anesthesia team needs to attend autopsy and walk the autopsy surgeon through the process and cascade of uh, events. And final opinion is recommended to be done uh, with discussions after discussions with the autopsy surgeon, the surgeon and the anesthetist in the case, and other expert consultants. Uh, objective of autopsy is similar to the one in surgical latest. Uh, and investigations of such data include histopathology, toxicology, and extraneous uh, specimen collection. So what do we need the histology samples for? To exclude any cardiovascular disorder like uh, myocarditis or even MI or thrombosis, uh, and to assess the severity of the original condition for which the operation was uh, done. Also, in uh, assessment of complications, of anesthesia as hypoxia, the brain is to be uh, sampled and sent for histopathology. So the somers area of the hippocampal gyrus and the cerebellum, the cerebellum are the ones recommended for histopathology sampling in demonstration of uh, hypoxia. There are also other uh, findings and uh, a primary suggested that the effects of hypoxia uh, are uh, relatively uh, confined to the white matter. So if you have to send the brain for the pathology, sample the white matter. So toxicological samples, uh, lungs, if inhalational agents are suspected to be the cause, lung tissue should be sent. And generally, uh, fat, mesenteric fat, skeletal muscle tissue, portion of the brain, some portion of the liver, and half of each kidney should be sampled so that if your surgeons and uh, anesthetists attending autopsy, make sure that these samples are uh, taken. Also blood and urine, uh, depending on the indication, CSF and heart blood, and if bacteriological and microbiological in general samples are indicated, blood, urine, and other body fluids may be collected. So, uh, Duties of the anesthetist and general advice for the anesthetist. Let's see a case. This is a 13 year old case. This is a case in the Lancet Journal. Uh, a 13 year old boy died nine days after an operation, uh, not worth nine days, with considerable brain damage at this hospital. During the investigation, the anesthetist says that while he was out of theater having a coffee break, the supply of oxygen failed. So there was a damage, a brain damage, and the anesthetist has said he was out for a coffee break when the supply of oxygen failed. 
So the investigating committee, this is the recommendation. It's the anesthetist's responsibility to see that anesthetic apparatus is working efficiently throughout an operation. So uh, you cannot blame it to someone else. If the anesthetic apparatus in general with all the supplies and the device uh, is not working, it's going to be the anesthetist's uh, responsibility. Also, the prime duty of the anesthetist is to care for his patient under anesthesia. So if the patient has not gained full consciousness, it's still the duty of the anesthetist. So extend your care uh, until the patient totally regains uh, control and is totally out of anesthesia. So also before leaving the theater, if you have to hand over your patients, make sure it has to be, here is a person who is competent, familiar with the apparatus, uh, and is able to care for the unconscious patient. Also notify the, the surgeon that you're leaving the OR. This is the recommendation. In general, the anesthetic team is recommended to do the following so that uh, litigations are not, uh, the life of the patient is not lost for the first uh, primary and uh, you would escape uh, litigations. So the general rule, those who deprive the patient of his protective reflexes are responsible for any injury. So when you administer anesthesia, you suppress, you depress the uh, reflexes that are protective. So you're basically the patient becomes vulnerable to uh, the conditions where those reflexes were uh, supposed to protect him from. So if you caused that suppression and of those protective reflexes, you have removed the protective uh, method for the patient and hence you're responsible for the consequences. So to avoid the, that, the anesthetist is generally advised to follow the these precautions, keep the patient in the recovery room till his conditions get stabilized and protective reflexes return to normal. So do not run to do not rush uh, to run the patient out of the recovery room and the operation room until his condition is stabilized and reflexes are returned to normal. Keep the patient in the recovery room and under follow up. Also issue clear and adequate instructions to the nursing staff of the recovery room and also for specific uh, problem to look for and to guard against. If there is peculiarities about that patient, clearly uh, write that instructions and communicate with the nursing staff. So keep the patient under personal supervision at least until all monitoring, mechanical ventilation, drainage, uh, for secretions and the like are properly and efficiently attended to. So, medical legal considerations for the surgeon and anesthetics in case of, uh, uh, of perioperative lasers. Uh, so, all lasers occurring during the course of anesthesia and the surgery or with the naval time afterwards should be reported to the police. Uh, I know this causes a lot of discomfort, uh, but it should not be hushed under the rug in fear of uh, embarrassment and being litigated for. Uh, uh, medical error and negligence. All co cases of anesthesia and surgery related death during the procedure or uh, within a reasonable uh, time afterwards should be reported to the police and they are not regarded as natural deaths. Uh, reasonable time later they could be uh, investigated and cleared as the death to be uh, the original disease process or other processes or the surgical procedure or the anesthetic procedure. But until uh, for that process to be uh, carried out, the uh, death should, should be reported and investigation should be ensured. So whenever you have cases related to anesthesia and surgery during the procedure or within a reasonable time afterwards, it's your duty to report to police. Uh, so reasonable time, what's reasonable time? Uh, it's not necessarily the few minutes after the operation uh, or the few days after the operation, as long as the but if test fits for the uh, operative circumstances to uh, be the cause of death, no matter what the time gap is, it's still a reasonable time. 
let's say a patient uh, develops a vertebral osteomyelitis that later caused uh, meningitis and the patient uh, died. If the vertebral osteomyelitis could be proven that it was from the anesthetic effect uh, or the procedure, still even after years, uh, even though the meningitis and the death occurs after years, provided that there was nothing intervening the procedure, the chain of events, still the anesthesia is uh, the anesthetic procedure is responsible for the death. Uh, so until investigations are complete and liability is proven for the medical team, the legal system, uh, nor the medical institution, the management or the staff or family of the victim should embarrass the surgical or anesthetic team. So the usual uh, occurrences of taking the whole uh, operating team to the uh, behind to prison and to keep them behind bars and to get the condition investigated while the team is uh, in prison is not a good and a recommended way to treat the medical staff involved in this until the liability is complete and uh, investigation is complete and liability is proven. Uh, so medical negligence uh, in these cases it's uh, in general the medical negligence is highly unlikely to be a result of a single uh, uh, action from the surgeon or from the anesthetist or from the nurse it's usually contributed by a chain of events and multitude of professionals so it's uh, it would be a bit too premature to coin the term medical negligence uh, to such uh, perioperative dates it's uh, relatively a rare occurrence and it's uh, also uh, an untoward process to call the to call out the surgeon or to call out the anesthetic to be responsible for such dates there are events where uh, those professionals are responsible but medical negligence by nature is not uh, usually the a result of a single uh, action from a single person. It's usually contributed by a multitude of professionals and a multitude of, a multitude of actions, and it's the, usually the result of defect in the medical care and follow-up than a single action in operation or anesthesia. So uh, I'm sure this is a topic of interest for many of you. Who is responsible? Is it the surgeon or the anesthetist? So uh, I'm sure we expect the forensic pathologist and the court to decide this for you clearly, but unfortunately it's very difficult to apportion relative contribution between the anesthetist and the search. So each one is responsible and one is not responsible. Each one is responsible for their own negligent acts and uh, there is no master and servant relationship. One does not uh, dictate and order the other. So they are independent teams, independent professionals. So they are responsible for their own actions. Uh, half, half, or uh, in between, on a midway, on a nagarai, or it's uh, relatively difficult. So uh, in uh, in exceptional cases, however, one may become liable for the wrongful acts of the other. Uh, if the patient dies because uh, of the, let's say the anesthetic mishap and the surgeon has observed that the surgeon is still liable to inform the anesthetic that uh, the procedure has been observed and to rectify the condition so this is a very exceptional situation and in reality it's very difficult to draw the line and each is um, responsible for the action of his own and his team so in teaching hospitals Apart from the surgeon and the anesthetic and the nursing staff and assistants, there are interns, residents, and fellows. So they uh, occur in the, to be the agents of the institution and they are part of the OR team. So it's still very difficult and the determination uh, of uh, roles in the date is to be done by the uh, agency and issue of control. So in this case, the one who has the right to hire and fire decides. 
So this is a picture showing large chronic uh, pressure sore in facial region. And in this case, the question becomes if the date follows this episode, uh, the usual question is, is the surgeon really responsible for this one? And usually uh, this is due to the chain of events and it shows the quality of nursing and medical care. It shows the defect in the quality of nursing and medical care. And medical negligence is usually in such cases where there is a chain of events leading to the death uh, and quite unlikely from the sole action of the surgeon and the anesthetic, the anesthetist. So uh, here are some interesting photos in autopsies uh, of uh, surgical and anesthetic cases. Here is uh, a gut strangulated through the handle of the forceps, and the autopsy was done uh, as the date has occurred six weeks uh, after the operation. And the uh, autopsy was done for the evaluation of uh, uh, pneumococcus assessment, pneumoconiosis assessment, and this was what was found. So here, uh, esophageal or esophageal fistula due to ruptured anastomosis causing fatal hematemesis. And here is a perforation in the rectum after a rectal biopsy. And here is a foreign body causing bronchial obstruction. Here, the midwife used uh, to suppress uh, and hold down the tongue of a pregnant woman. So these are my references, and this would be... I have finished my presentation. Thank you for your attention and time. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abelard. It was a, a very nice presentation and clear one as well, as well as uh, an important point of discussion for today. So, because uh, uh, quite uh, enough amount of time, we can let's only address one question in the chat box, and we can end uh, the session. Okay. Shall I read the question? Uh, the question is, uh, I think, in situations from uh, Abdi Nasser Muhammad, in yes. situations yes. where, okay. Uh, in situations where uh, error in the OR has happened and the surgeon or anesthesia team are accused, how does the forensic pathologist approach in sharing his finding with the surgery team and also act within the legal framework to avoid being accused of bias? Okay, let me start from the accused of bias. Uh, as I have mentioned in the uh, initial slides of the presentation, the forensic pathologist and uh, the institution is advised to be an independent one from where the um, uh, OR and the surgery has happened. So this could uh, relatively avoid bias. Uh, and also the forensic pathologist is a doctor, so there is a, an odd to serve without a bias and without uh, siding. So we hope that uh, the forensic pathologist remembers that odd. Uh, in the situation where uh, the team, the surgery team, and the assist team, uh, sharing his pending, him are accused. So accusation uh, shouldn't uh, occur before the case is fully investigated and conclusion is uh, arrived upon. So. Uh, the surgery and the anesthetic team should not be accused of anything before that. The case is under investigation, and uh, if there is anyone to be labeled as guilty or to be accused, uh, I think uh, it should be after the investigation is complete. Uh, even though those uh, professionals are under question, uh, in this case, they're still uh, they still are entitled to attain to attend the autopsy. Just because they are accused, it doesn't mean they should be uh, kept away from the entire investigation process. I think uh, I have answered. I don't know. Let me know in the comment if I have not answered the question. 
Okay, and the autopsy be done in that hospital. Okay, the similar question from Saron Alpha. Uh, autopsy is recommended to be done in an, institu in an independent institution for three reasons, as I've mentioned in the presentation. The first one, to demonstrate the independence uh, of the investigating team uh, to the public and the private uh, team. Uh, the second one is to uh, spare the uh, professional of embarrassment. And uh, the third one is so that the uh, bias is uh, relatively removed. So I think the person asking the question says it was uh, the first question says it was thinks it was really interesting and stimulating presentation. Keep it up. Oh, thank you. But I think the uh, question has been answered already. Thank you for letting me know, Abdul Nasir. All right. Doesn't that cause a delay? Okay. Uh, I don't think preoperative evaluations cause a delay in management. If it's an emergency one, uh, there are acceptable uh, conditions to miss. And similarly, the risk to benefit uh, uh, ratio rises in that case, so the surgeon is justified. However, still perioperative, uh, not preoperative uh, diagnosis in the acceptable degree should always be done. And also autopsies are requested by the faculty and the surgeon and instead joins. Uh, okay, family uh, can report the conditions to the question from uh, Saron Alpha. Uh, family can report the conditions to the police, uh, but they cannot request autopsy. The police, ideally, the police and the uh, coroner. Uh, should request the autopsy if they are satisfied that there is a medical legal case to be investigated. So uh, even though the, they have the suspicion uh, that if the surgeon and uh, anesthetist attend the autopsy that the results should be modified, it's still the protocol. They have to be uh, explain that too, and they have to be convinced. Otherwise, the results without uh, the surgeon and anesthetist attending are worse, far more, far more worse. Okay. I think we're done with the questions, yeah. right? Yeah. So, thank you very much, Dr. Abinet. On behalf of Plains Ethiopia and all our participants for uh, taking the time to present an important discussion point in a, a clear and informative way. We also would love to thank you for continually taking the time to present on our platform on related cases and we hope to see you again with other topics as well. So for our participants who want to access previous seminars by Dr. Rabinet, you can find them in our YouTube channel and Bluehead's CPD website. So, Dr. Avnet, thank you very much again. And if there is any other uh, thing that you want to add, please let me let me give you the chance one more time. I don't have much to add. Thank you for having me to discuss uh, issues of um, and topics of my interest. I hope to see you in. Uh next uh, presentations and thank you for participants for your time and taking the time to listen to me oh so, yeah good night everybody all right thank you very much doctor and good night, good night.